if the computer goes into sleep, um, it disables some of the USB Can drivers or ports somehow, and then if it gets waken up, it doesn't always initiate them correctly, which I think is the issue here. You set, set it up uh, so that it doesn't go to sleep in preferences? Um, yeah, there, there's actually, I, I did get some um, just... Last week, I got an email with some solutions that I can do. So um, I think I, I just have to implement it on here. Okay. Um, but yeah, I do believe I have. So we, we, we do have the settings changes. Oh, that's really loud. Mm -hmm. Turn that down a little bit. Let me see when the call is supposed to start. I thought it was already, I thought it was 2.20. Yeah, probably they started it, uh, it, it started 10 minutes ahead. 2.25 is what I have. Okay. okay, I'll stay until it connects. And uh, I will need to leave and okay. come back yeah. because uh, I need to bring an important guest who will not find the way. Yeah, yeah. What I'll do is when it starts, I'll bring the computer back up and then I'll leave. So I think it should be good. Many thanks. Yeah. It smells like lilac, but not quite like lilac. Oh, it's that. Oh. That's what it smells like. Lilac. Mm. I don't think so. Huh? Is this a good picture taking place? You're the, you're the photographer. Okay, let's grab some. Yes, let's grab some chocolate. Snickers, mints. No, oh, minis. Hey, don't take my Snickers. But you don't get all of them. Yeah, this all of one is for here. See, this, this is, this and is, he's going to be too. Right here, right there. So you sat down by the Snickers. Let me get them all. The Snickers right there. You pig. You animal. You filthy animal. What movie is that from? Or what movie quotes the movie? Home Alone. Filthy animal. And then just... Conference is now starting. You are the first person to arrive. You will now be placed into the conference. I'm excited for tonight. What? Ice cream cake? What's ice cream cake? At my house? Wait, I'm invited to your birthday party or what? I'm going home. Minneapolis house. Oh. I didn't see my niece. Well, that's gonna be cute. Maybe. I hope she pukes all over you. No, we're not puking over Leroy. Right.
Is that your final? Yeah. You should use 10. Why? Why? You never correct them. Something new to me. I'm not going to show this instrument. No, they can come and get it from you. Yeah, they're not from here, yeah. What is, it, is this for grading? I hope not. It's clearly for grading. But there are only one. Oh, it's for all the students the same. Corresponding the level of presentation. Oh my goodness. Oh gosh. This, this is a lot of reading. Take longer to fill this out than our actual presentation, probably. I'm. I i did not know that it's going to happen. Then we just how, long, how, how long are you going to talk? Probably like five. Like my last three slides are just pictures from the labs. Looks like. Oh, well, I guess we could have done that. Mine are. Let me check the others. Very simple. Yeah. I wish you would have um, emailed out the the boxes to us before pasting them in the slides. Oh, like what we're supposed to cover? Or yeah, because I don't really cover most of them. Like, I don't cover 10. No one has allergy to I this tree so. I hope Not that I know of. I'll find out. Is it, is it lilac? lilac or is it a different type of tree? Because it doesn't quite smell like lilac. It's not lilac. No, no, okay. it's not. It's having some uh, fruits after it's done. <laughs> oh, really? oh. In a... Like edible? Uh, you don't know. Well, it. <laughs> it smells very good. Whom are we waiting? Dan? Waiting? Dan and Sam. I don't Sam's know if coming. Sam's coming. Sam is not coming. He found an excuse. I don't know, because he didn't want it to present or because he, it really was too late to change his plans. Can you email to Dan? And who email to Dan? I will. Can someone email to Dan? Oh, Dan was emailing to, to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that photo, Brandon. Oh, so good. Yeah, he decided, first I thought that I should be shy and remove it, but then I decided, okay, it's his hobby. Why, why should I remove it? <laughs> it's fun. You didn't like that one? I did. Oh, okay, I, good. No. That's I'm, probably my no. favorite one he's taken thus far that I've Well, seen. this is a different one. No. Uh -huh. yeah, this I, is, I saw that on Google Drive. Oh, you looked at my Google Drive and saw that one? I thought so. It was on the link that you sent. Right. Yeah. 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 So I'm saying you can see it. No, no catch. No catch. <laughs> you actually... I didn't know you were throwing me in on me. You can't say catch <laughs> and throw it at my back. <laughs> That's why you said catch and then catch. <laughs> I'm typing. I'm throwing. <laughs> Dion, what is his number today? Four, right? In, in he, did he send an email saying that he will not come or what? No, he sent an email with an updated presentation. Oh. I um, exposed a little of friendly criticism to his presentation in the 3 a.m. And yeah. <laughs> That's crazy that you're up at 3 a.m. off the... My brain would not be active right now. Well, we just returned from the party. Oh. <laughs> well, we returned at 1 a.m. What, end of the semester party? Maybe three. Huh? End of the semester party? No, it just was party of um, <laughs> Professor Bhakti Yor. Oh. Rasulif was kind of just having party because he's having 
some people from his previous group who came to him to help him to set up all his whatever some research kind of things and now they're leaving so he wants you guys play mafia? <laughs> no, we but he, he actually also moved to a new apartment and oh. it's having very nice facilities for uh, different types of games like, you know, tennis, I mean, small oh. tennis, table tennis, uh, yes, yes. mini golf, uh, some Sorry, other kind of thing. Not a problem, not a problem. Thanks uh, for so updating. It's really a lot of fun. Oh. So you can go my email and it's really nice new apartment. Uh, like all facilities were so nice. As and then we have a barbecue, ignore. also very nice area for barbecue. It's very comfortable, you. cheap. So they have a phantom there. I'm very I'm very good. Give it to you. Oh, look, it's Paige. Hey, we were... Waiting for you. you he's only a minute or late. Or you just, told, you just told me to give it to you. <laughs> I mean, usually um, he's late. Yeah, okay, to get it. But no, waiting for me is inside the waiting for other people. So no, but it you're cancels. last. You're Where's last? Sam? He's not. He will be not able to come at all. Oh, will he graduate? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, I think everyone who can is here. So let's uh, start. Many thanks for many thanks for uh, coming, and many thanks for investing a lot of your time into developing an extended format of this quantum two force. So um, you are pioneers of uh, making of bringing this course on the next level and uh, next generations will remember you. Your names will be, uh, how to say, on the plug as a pioneers of this course. So you not just um, learned yourself, but you help next generations to learn. So who we are and what we are doing. It is the last meeting in the... Levi, are you giving great to me? The pink <laughs> form is for grades. No, I'm just filling out the name. Oh, okay. <laughs> I hope you got scared. <laughs> okay, so it is a uh, meeting number 27 in the course CHEM 767. By the end of the course, I was able to memorize these numbers. So it is advanced quantum theory. And uh, in the future, this course will have a substantial um, coursework part. But as a pioneers, you have less um, tasks. And therefore, we will do a special shorter but uh, still very important last meeting students who participate in the course will summarize most important parts of the course in uh, there were five chapters and uh, all in this will uh, have picked up one chapter by free will and will present the best part of this chapter according to their understanding then we will after each talk we will go to a discussion session and uh, you, you are encouraged to please your colleagues by uh, torturing questions. Um, so what was the um, goal of the course? Why did we spend a lot of time? And you sacrificed more than needed time. The uh, original course was uh, two credit, and we placed as much effort as four uh, credit course which is very much appreciated. You, so you did 200% effort. Um, this course goes out of box compared to regular introduction to quantum theory. In the regular introduction to quantum theory, one is looking onto, only onto exactly solvable models, onto general principles and s simple models that can be solved analytically forever. If we make our connection to real life, we immediately realize that not all models, not all processes, molecules, nanostructures that were we need to apply quantum theory can be solved exactly. Therefore, our basic core of knowledge should be expanded into several directions. So what we were doing during the course, we were expanding in five directions, although there are more than five. So what if we have several exactly solvable models coupled to each other or just placed together? 
and it will be first uh, chapter, first presentation. Then what if the energy operator of the exactly solvable model is slightly changed by so-called perturbation? This will be the second chapter. Then what if the model is being shaked in a delicate way, periodically? This will be the third uh, chapter. Then what if it is shaked without delicacy? What is it if it is wildly shaked? If the external field driving system crazy? It will be the fourth chapter and the last one uh, will be here are the um, this apostrophes which tells there is no violation of conservation of energy but what is considered in the fifth chapter looks very much like violation of conservation of energy. So it deals with dissipation of energy away from the system. Irreversible process. And this goes definitely beyond the um, exactly solvable models. So the I was doing it at 3 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> So the, uh, some of you may ask yourself a question, why did I spend so much time sitting here? Do I get any benefit rather than driving my blooming young brains? There should be benefit in addition to academic development. So the contents of the course has purpose to help you in your research, so your background to methods, to help you to generate new research results, hopefully. And in your academic life, which you presumably chosen since you are in graduate school, you will write manuscripts that will contain description of your results and description of your methods. And then, and then after you have written your manuscripts, you are sending it to a blind review, where sometimes friendly, sometimes aggressive bloodthirsting reviewers trying to criticize what you have written. And your purpose as stand alone, as growing independent researchers is to keep the strike or learn how to protect it. Very often, the reviewers will put under the doubt the methodology that you have used. And you need to be able to deviate from linear protocol of data generation and tell what would happen if one use a little different method or if, what, if you would change the protocol. So in order to refute the criticism of reviewers, you need to broaden your horizons and have a little um, idea about other methods, even if you do not directly use them. So here is the snapshot of the uh, whole course. So each chapter was containing about five, six uh, meetings plus students' presentations on, on applications, five chapters. And uh, our last chapter is summary of, of, the, of all chapters. So when presenters are coming up, they will find their presentations uploaded to this station. You just find it, click on it to expand, and present here. So stay in this rectangle to be on the camera. And um, please do not be surprised if you find a little additions to your presentations. There will be a little addition of summary of all lectures included in the chapter that you are presenting, giving a prompt to visitors what you can be asked, what you are expected to be educated about. And at the end, there, are, there is a list of uh, applications that uh, were presented by attendees of the class at the end of, of each chapter. It also gives um, out-of-the-box thinking of how the discussion can be pursued. So the minimum time for presentation is three minutes. So no one will be um, criticized for being too short. But the discussion time is not much limited. So the shorter your presentation, the longer is the discussion. <laughs> So with this, I would like. Oh no, no, too, too early, too early. With this, I would like to invite the first speaker, Brendan Gifford, 
who will help us to recall background information about a uh, chapter with angular momentum. Floor is yours. OK. All right, so in uh, the previous quantum class, we talked a lot about angular momentum in, uh, in, in a system where you have like a single spin or a single um, I guess nucleus. And so in this case, uh, we wanted to talk about the addition of angular momentum and or to, uh, I'm sorry, talk about two different spins in the system. And so some examples of this would be the addition of angular momentum and spin um, in a system where you have, say, uh, an electron that has an angular momentum and spin, you have to consider both, um, as in case like spin over coupling, and interactions of spins in two systems. So if you have more than one electron and they both have spin, um, I guess, uh, how, how, how they interact. And so we know that the spin generally follows these two, or these rules, um, as far as uh, which quantum states are allowed, and so those are still the rules for our system. Um, but in this case, uh, in, or, in order to modify what we previously learned, uh, we're going to be using some different base, uh, a different basis, and that basis is, we went over in class quite detailed, but I guess in simple you can get it from the chart, uh, from what they call Clef Gordon coefficients. And so in this chart, um, the rows are the magnetic numbers, or M1 and M2. And so then the columns are the, um, the, uh, the, the, com the combined spins, uh, list the combined spins. So these are the magnetic numbers in, the, in these. And then the, the columns here are the combined spins. And then so this is the system it's applicable to. And so then the basis is in, given in these, I guess, diagonal boxes. Um, that you would use for a system of combined spins. And so that was the first major concept was Klebsch Gordon coefficients. And so we also talked about uh, term symbols. So um, these are Russell Sounders term symbols. And so this was just a way of us uh, simplifying the notation for term symbols. And I actually realized on my slide I forgot to put the term symbol, but it would be 2s plus 1, capital L, and then the base J, which we all remember, where uh, 2s plus 1 is the total spin, l is the angular momentum, and then uh, j is the total angular momentum. And so those, uh, those term symbols then um, can be expressed for systems where we have different, different numbers of spins in the system, so for different elements to get different term symbols. And um, so then we talked about in great details how to get these term symbols and then uh, acquired them. What is this? <laughs> Which of the applications you like the best? Oh, which one I like the best? <laughs> Wait, what? This is what we presented when we presented. Oh, I see. Which one I like the best? Um, well, which one do you remember? Oh, which one do I remember? <laughs> That's, a That's a good question. I would have to say this guy had a pretty good presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that week, but that was the first one. I think Sam was probably the best that week. That was my favorite. But what is it? Spin states of defects and diamonds for quantum information. He, uh, he, had, um, he had the Russell Sounders term symbols in a different notation for the, I don't know, that might have been Levi. I, that was, I had it in a different notation. Actually, I guess I don't because remember. Because that's oh, what that's right. the symmetry. So it was actually Levi's then, where we where he introduced a different term symbol, term symbol notation that I didn't quite actually fully get, but for the complexes. Is that it? And then wait, wait. So I want to show a picture that I took. So thank you for being good photographic subjects throughout the semester. <laughs> okay, let's thank Brendan. And his presentation is open for discussion. Uh -oh. Which question Dan has to Brendan? What is singlet vision? Singlet vision? <laughs> <laughs> Who talked about that? Oh, you did? <laughs> no, um, no. Give him a hint so that he doesn't. I don't, I don't recall. This. Oh, oh boy. We also discussed it in a group meeting several times. Singlet vision? Did we use a different name? What was it? No, it was exactly the same. Singlet? Fusion means split. One like split state splits into. Oh, into two different. 
triplet states? Yes, yes, okay. yes. great it's, answer. It's an analog of what? Of spin orbit coupling, I guess. In that case? No. no. What? One exciton, you get him. Two exciton. Oh, by exciton formation? Is that what? Yeah, yes. it's an analog of, of, of? of multi carrier generation in a solid state, right? Ah. But this is similar approach, but to soft materials, to polymers and molecules. Organic. Very, very good, very good. Uh, can you scroll back a couple of slides? Yes, here. Can you circle by your finger the Klebsch Gordon coefficient in this uh, notation? In? On the right side. Oh, in this one? Mm -hmm. So it's the, the J's, right? Mm -hmm. J1. J1, J. So coefficient should be a number, neither operator nor a vector. It's not in there, is it? It is there. <laughs> the expectation value, that one? Yeah. Yeah. Great, that's correct answer. And <laughs> how many indices does Klebsch Gordon coefficient have? Well, for it, that, that depends on the, the spin state, right? Where number of indices, not their values. Oh, it would be two. Try again. <laughs> Just look on your formula. <laughs> one for one for each, one for each particle. And then you have J and M. Yeah. Okay, what is J? What what is M? How would you verbalize it by words? So J and M are the the. Uh, properties that correspond to the first particle for ones and correspond to the second particle for But uh, J so. and M, which of them is? Which is which? which oh, is M is magnetic and J is the um, angular momentum. Good. And uh, how many indices you can find in this object? Two? J, oh, well, in, uh, non, in, non um, coinciding indices. Eight? Is it correct? Four. Ask, ask Dale. Please help him. How many different ones are there inside? Is two for M and one for J. Twos. Mm. J's. But J go over one and two, and M go over one and two, so total. totally. So two. Plus <laughs> no. two. two plus two? Well M goes there's two. Oh, and two M and you have two different J. Yes, yes. So four. <laughs> so the way you try it, try it. Two times two. Four. No? The way you read the table is two and then two from the other side. And it's it's four. Yeah, this is what he told us, right? Yeah. I still so right. count count. for the benefits one. So you expand total, you expand uh, quantum state of the overall system or qu quantum state over two particular systems. Yes, right. So big quantum, big system is specified by two indices and each of the small systems specified by two indices. Oh, so each all set. Yes, that's oh. correct answer. Let's, so you're uh, including the sum of them? But yes. your <laughs> big system indices. They're always there. They're oh. Oh. More questions? No? Okay. No. Thank you, Brandon. Okay. So, uh, will you find the way? Yeah. I'll help you. Okay. So, the next speaker is Levan Lustrum, who will help us to recall main ideas. And maybe he will tell a couple of uh, words about applications of so called time independent perturbation theory. Floor is yours. Thank you all for coming. Um, so, I'll be talking about time independent perturbation theory, mostly of the theory behind it. So, first, uh, this is mainly used in problems that uh, you cannot solve exactly, but you can relate to a problem that you can solve with high accuracy. So that is H naught, and there's some correction that's H prime, and this lambda is like a scaling 
parameter, so you can ramp that up and down depending on uh, your uh, how much deviation you have. There are some uh, there are some assumptions that your h prime and your h uh, not are somewhat similar. They're not like total, they won't give you totally different answers. Um, your eigenvalues are known for h not, and then your eigenvalues and eigenfunctions do not greatly de uh, deviate from your uh, h prime to h naught. So to expand the wave function, we do it in uh, like powers. So the first term is zero power, then first, second, third, and you can go as many uh, powers as you want. Uh, most of the time, people do first and second uh, perturb perturbation theory. And when you plug in your Hamiltonian acting on your wave function, you get your eigenvalues and your eigenfunctions back. And you have to do some uh, al uh, algebra to get your eigenvalues. But for uh, the first order of correction for energy, it is just the expectation value of the unperturbed wave functions uh, where your Hamiltonian is your perturbed wave function. And then your, uh, the correction for your wave function is uh, a similar term divided by the difference in the energy of the M and N state times your unperturbed wave function. Um, so with this, you can get different uh, values. Like you could do um, dispersion. So if you want to try and figure out uh, Van der Waals interaction, you can uh, choose your H prime to be like one over X to the fourth or x, x is some number, and then you can pull out your correction, and then you can hopefully get an analytical solution. And that's what is typically done in a lot of uh, like DFT functionals. Um, so in conclusion, perturbation theory can help solve very difficult or impossible uh, problems by uh, connecting your unperturbed wave function and your perturbed wave function that are the act similarly on the system, uh, and then you can get first order, you can do second order, third order, um, but I just showed first order today. Um, so then these are what we talked about. In this presentation, I did not go over uh, degenerate cases. For degenerate, when your energies are the same, so like d orbitals, uh, I presented on this when we did it in the class, you solve everything and then you just pull out the blocks that are degenerate. So if it's d orbitals, then you uh, pull out the d orbital and you manipulate that to get the uh, energy split in. So are, are there any questions? Okay, let's thank you guys for a very uh, dense presentation and it's open for discussion. So you have your uh, several orders, right, of corrections. Yes. And the higher the order of the correction, the smaller the correction is, right? Yes. By itself. So, but what to do? What to do if your first order correction equals to zero? Does then, it mean that you stop? No. So if your first order correction is zero, you can go to second order. And I know I read some places where they said first order is not a good approximation, so then you go to second order. So there are some cases where you are indeed correct that the first order perturbation theory does not give reasonable corrections, so then you can go to second order. And I would say if I was doing it in like research, I would first try first order and see what happens and then go to second order. And just so then you don't just add a whole bunch of computational costs to your method before jumping into second order. Okay. More questions? Some of the examples, please provide some of the examples where perturbation theory helps to predict outcome of an experiment in the atomic spectroscopy. Where do you see level splitting? So, uh, is it shark? No. 
Star. Star. You can... But if, if you do not remember names, what is the experiment? So if you have uh, like hydrogen atom and you put it inside a magnetic fi field, magnetic, electric, mm -hmm. uh, it will the energy levels will split, and that is one place where you can try and use perturbation theory. Which to... order? Second, first order, <laughs> and you can also do like spin orbit coupling, dispersion. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Stark effect is one of the examples of successful application of perturbation theory. If there are no more questions, but thank you once again. And the next presentation. Okay, I do have a question. Oh, just very quick. Uh, for the Stark effect, can you see Stark effect not only in electric fields? Like, is it possible to make analogy to the Stark effect in the atoms? when electric, external electric field is not applied? Yes, so if you have a nucleus like oxygen that has more than one electron going around it, your energy levels become degenerate. So like your S and P orbitals without multiple electrons would just be constant, and then if you add another electron, it splits. They non-degenerate. Yes. Because? you have interaction between the two electrons. Okay, so you have kind of uh, yeah. the internal electric field. Yes. More questions? If not, let's thank you very once again. And the next presenter is Mohammad Abu Javed, who will uh, help us to recall chapter number three about time-dependent perturbation theory. Thank you, Dimitri. <clears throat> so this is we cover in this part. We first uh, derive the formula for the time-dependent functional uh, time-dependent perturbations, and then and apply the different types of uh, perturbations, harmonic perturbations, and formula level discuss about that one and also periodic change one. So as Levi already discussed, it uh, is almost similar, but only difference is in our case in these cases the perturbation is time-dependent. So we have to solve, uh, treat at this one with the, with the time dependency. So for this one, I just, uh, this is just a formulation of the formula. If we consider the two level system, I just uh, give you an example with the two level system. So getting the linear combination of two basis set of these two level, and then we are getting this uh, with the time evolution part, and it is the time evolution, uh, time dependent basis, basis functions. And so in this case, <coughs> If we want to get the uh, part of part, I just put in the time dependent Schrodinger equations and then solve the equations. If we solve the equation with these basis functions, finally we will get uh, these equations in this one. And now, and after the solve with this one, we will get a time dependent change of the coefficient Ca by by using this formula and if we put the psi a on this one and we'll come up with this one and if we put psi b and then we'll come up with uh, cb i mean this is the time that ddt of cb so after the perturbation now we are getting the change of the coefficients a and b with the time that's our important part here then if we put this number we will get a basis function on the time t with perturbations and for the, if we want to put the first order and second order, so this I'm showing the first order TD, uh, <coughs> perturbation here. If we solve the part, first order perturbations, you will get this, um, and this term is zero because it's a diagonal part and non-diagonal and non-diagonal part is non-zero term. So we will get uh, simplified this uh, to coefficient here. And if we solve the coefficient, we after the integration, we will get, get this term here. And for example, I'm just putting only one example here for sinusoidal perturbations. If we consider these perturbations, these are periodic perturbations. And we will solve these equations, and then we will get a transition from the first part to the second part. So I'm showing this one here, sorry, first step to second step. This is the, after the solution of the other one, population of the ground state and the excited state, we get a transition probability from the ground state to the excited state. And this is the geometrical representation of the result. This is the based on the time 
with the populations, and this is uh, with the uh, uh, periodic difference, energy difference, on, based on this one. It's known as a sink function, I guess. Yeah. This, this type of things. So this is the one result of the perturbation theory, and by this one, this we presented it after the this chapter. I presented spontaneous emissions. I solved these coefficients, Einstein coefficients, and their coefficients, and show, and we can use these informations for emission calculations and for physics. And thank you. Okay, let's end. And his presentation is open for discussion. <laughs> no, you can see the bottom of the screen. No, no, no. no. You cannot. Right okay. Here. Yeah, actually. Okay. We ask question to, to 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 Jabu. <laughs> yeah. Please, um, Professor. I was the first. So, <laughs> this is a second. Um, so, if you go in your previous slide, right, with your sin, uh, sinusoidal um, perturbation, right? Why is it? So important, what is the physical meaning or what is a physical uh, analogy, whatever? So where, if where this perturbation can be seen or something like that? Electromagnetic wave, if we, so this perturbation types of tidy periodic perturbations kind of like, so in that case we can use this, this result on there. So actually this example which you're showing, it's really showing how the uh, <coughs> electromagnetic field interact with two level system. Two level right? system, yeah. So, I think it's like one of your last slides, yeah, it's your last slide before, yeah, this one. What is the population shown here? This P is showing this and probability of changing. Oh, probability, yeah. Population. Is a population, is a uh, population transfer from the ground state to the excited state. Not the populations of the ground state, it's the transition, I mean, pro probability of the transition of the electrons from the ground to the excited state. So this transition is changing with the time of this period here. We did the practical here with this one. Huh? We did a practical on the MATLAB, right? This one? I, I didn't know if it was the ground state or the excited state. No, this one is the probability of the transition from the transition probability, not the ground state probability. So, you have a two-level system and yeah, you have I some sort of perturbation. Mm -hmm. Sorry? You have a two-level system mm -hmm. and you have a sinusoidal perturbation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you need time dependent? I mean, the whole, right, the whole second half of the course was solving the two-level system with a sinusoidal perturbation. Exactly. Why do you need time dependent perturbation? Oh. <laughs> like a toy model? This kind of, for example, for showing the presentation result. No. You don't have answer? Not the exact answer. Let's postpone answer on this question onto His the next minute. Oh. Please scroll back. Back. Or back. Or Okay, bring on the presentation once again and go to the slide number two. Here. For, okay. for me, so which uh, lectures did you overview today in, in your summarizing presentation? Okay, and what about the next three? Yeah, our Fermi Golden Rule. Yes, it tell us about Fermi Golden Rule, what it is. So, Let's just read that, but in verbally it's, it's your it's main task of your presentation. Tell us, uh, like, in, uh, recall, help us to recall what is Fermi's golden rule. So Fermi's golden rule is saying that if I have a mm, different state is giving us a some what should I say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't this where we went from a two-level system to a multi-level system? Yeah, this one, even multi-level systems, it will give us uh, some selectivity of the transferring the and transition from the ground state, which transition state should go, then there are mathematical relations on that. Good enough. What is the equation for Fermi's golden rule? 
Can you go to the whiteboard and write it down? Uh, no, 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 maybe Twister. Twister. Yeah. Oh, you, 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 you can help. use your, again, your example might be useful for this at the very last slide, which we just already discussed. Might give you some hint, hopefully, right? Um, or not? I did the formula yesterday. It doesn't count. <laughs> so what is on the left part of the Fermi's golden rule? Left part, left part is this term. No, no, do not tell this term. I, I'm blind. Tell me by what. The transition from the transition probability from the ground state to the highest excited state. I would say rate. Alright. Oh yeah. Okay. The rate okay. of that transition. Okay. What is it proportional to? It's proportional to the energy difference of this two state. And also I this omega not minus omega. You better go to the blood board. Mm -hmm. Try. Please try. Um, you didn't introduce coupling between your uh, perturbing system and your system of interest. Does it enter into your Fermi's golden rule? This stand? The letter V. Does it enter into the Fermi's golden rule? And you have in your formula letter V, right? What does it mean here? Letter E over V. V. V, v like <laughs> Victor. Yeah, that's a potential of this theory potential term. Mm -hmm. This uh, amplitude of the potential. Huh? What? Interaction energy? Interaction energy. Yeah. Does it enter into Fermi's golden rule? It should. Mm -hmm. Let's, there should uh, be a coupling between your ground state mm -hmm. and the excited state, right? Otherwise, the transition will never happen mm -hmm. if yeah. they completely disattached and do not. So please, each please other. write down K, which is great. Proportion. Okay. Proportional or equal? Okay. Well, let's this proportional first. <laughs> now, and then list uh, everything what is it is proportional to. Proportional to the should be. In which power? Quadratic. Huh? What here? What is V? That's two. That's a two. That's oh, sorry, it's two. It look, looks like Roman five for me. <laughs> Good. What else? And W non minus or omega non minus omega this term. Is it just by itself, or it enters as argument to some other function? And you have your picture there illustrating something, this, on the right side, right? So. Do not write explicitly. Uh, well, write whatever you like, but. But what does your right picture illustrate? All right. What is, what is, what is it? What is this? This one is just transition with the uh, frequency. What Good. is it? So, in your Fermi's golden rule, you have dependence on frequency offset, which looks like a peak at a resonance condition. Which function gives you peak at a resonance condition, if you think as a math mathematician? Without much details, generally. In abstract form. It's too, too, that's correct, but too much details. What a general, very abstract. A function, that continuous function, that gives a pike at a resonance condition. The name of this function starts with letter D. Oh. 
Think of a galaxy with no Langer. For matrices, it was by Kronecker. Listen to us and write symbol. <laughs> you, you take that curve and you yeah. smush it, so it keeps smushing it together. Like, what is that eventually going to look like? <laughs> Brandon, you should, <laughs> yes. take, you should take, take pictures of Levi, who is trying to <laughs> <laughs> make yeah. some really yes. <laughs> magic signs. Let's go. Is Let's cover it. I know. Wait for right answer. <laughs> That's what I said. Like, that's why he should t take take your so function. So it's related to the data function. There's a function of what? Of which argument? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. We already give you the hint, right? So this is a function which having a peak at some resonance conditions. What are the resonance conditions? Mm -hmm. Omega minus. What is the sign between omega and omega zero? Sorry. What is the sign between? Yeah. Them? Here it is minus, and in your delta function. <laughs> yeah, on the threshold of a big discovery. When your resonance happens, what is your omega and omega not? So when omega is equal, it's close to the zero, or to five, uh, difference of this one, and then it's going to the close to the delta. Okay, so after delta, you need to have two brackets because it is continuous function. Function. It's not discrete; it is continuous. Therefore, it has argument in the brackets. After simple delta, yes. Open. One bracket and close and uh, and close the bracket. Yes. And what is inside the brackets? Sine function. Simpler, simpler. Delta function is non-zero if two frequencies are equal. Omega. Stop, enough, enough. Look on us and see if you have like approval signs from everyone. Okay, now delete the subscript under under delta. And extra brackets, probably. Delete the subscript. And delete the denominator in the yes. Much better, much better. Now look at us and ask uh, if anything is missing. Like ask Dia. Yeah, there is a prefactor that always comes out. It's uh, in front. It's a constant in front. Well, it holds a number and a, and a fundamental constant. All proportion. Proportion. Okay. Okay. This is good enough. Now, please come to the front, and there will be more questions to you. So, um, there are two theories, and you recently introduced both of them to us. In one theory, the population of originally empty level grows quadratically. In another theory, population of originally empty level grows linearly in time. So, one case, quadratic, another linear. Give us the theories. Uh, it depends on the omega minus omega not zero. If it's too big, so no, no, don't look on equations. Just look at me or look inside yourself. It depends on energy offset. So energy offset is much higher than two two theories. One gives linear, another quadratic. So which theories? Yeah, one is... And you discussed both of them right now. How, how many states what? do you have? How many states? In this case, we have a two state. Mm -hmm. So this one will be... At yeah, the limit of time, approved, yeah. time very close to zero. So in that case, it will be more... 
linearly if the only two is there. So, so if we consider the Fermi there is a, rules, uh, yeah. So there is a time-dependent perturbation theory and there is a fermi golden rule. Mm -hmm. Which one gives linear growth? Which one gives quadratic growth? This one will give us a linear growth in this one. No, tell which theory gives and linear growth, which, which is quadratic. In perturbation theory? In perturbation theory, it's population growth? In order to close time, then it will give linearly increased. How, do, how, do, how does this function look like if you focus on when this? Is it more linear or quadratic? This one more linear. Uh huh. Oh, no, it's in quadratic. Yes, yeah. great. So for time dependent perturbation theory, the population grows quadratically. Yeah. Okay, and for Fermi's golden rule, population grows linearly. Great. It was was absolutely correct answer, and we all should know it for the rest of our life. Many thanks to Javit, and now we are continuing our travel, our arcade, our quest into the time-dependent domain. The next presentation will be presented by Diane Mikhailov. Do I have a little um, yellow thing? Yes. Would you like them? No, that's what I don't. I was oh. wondering where it is. So <laughs> your yellow things are here, and then after you talk about them, you can back, go back to your PowerPoint. Okay, this doesn't have names on it. That's fine. Um, but we. No, these are the topics. Oh, these are the topics. Okay, so we will cover. We won't cover rotating frame explicitly. Um, it's just an approximation so that uh, that's, it simplifies the map. It's very easy to look up. We'll definitely introduce rabbi oscillations, pulse area theorem, density matrix approach, blocks equations, and how longitudinal and transversal relaxation comes out of the density matrix approach. Um, and actually will introduce the phasing free induction decay and spin echo uh, as well nonlinear time dependent phenomena we will discuss this after the presentation <laughs> okay so um, what we did was but let me uh, you may want to bring your, uh, your PDF to the full screen mode. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, with time dependent perturbation theory, we started dealing with problems where uh, we have a time dependent Hamiltonian that depends on. Uh, some non-interacting Hamiltonian or a Hamiltonian when there is no external force driving the system, plus uh, a perturbation that absorbs all the time dependence. So, and we uh, looked at some exactly solvable problems for this kind of Hamiltonian. And turns out that uh, as far as I can tell from going to the literature, the only exactly solvable problems with this kind of Hamiltonian without doing perturb without perturbative expansion is two-level system. We're an oscillating, sinusoidally oscillating potential. So the uh, the perturbation depends uh, is uh, has some the oscillates sinusoidal as a function of time. There is one more. There is one more system. There is one more system, but I didn't find it in literature. So. Harmonic oscillator in a uh, oscillating field. But we are not covering okay. it right now. Okay, this is another to topic of discussion. So what one first needs to do is combine the Schrodinger picture and the Heisenberg picture into what we call the interaction picture. So we did a lot of math on the board and we came up with a Schrodinger equation where instead of the full Hamiltonian, 
uh, acting on your state on your right, you had this, just this part, and we had a Heisenberg equation of motion where instead of the full Hamiltonian, you substituted this H naught. So this is very clever quantum mechanics that was figured out a long time ago in the early years of quantum mechanics. But it gives us a very useful equation for the occupation numbers of uh, our uh, um, the, the occupation numbers of the particles that we have in our system uh, as a function of time. So one obtains a set of coupled differential equations based on however many levels you have in your system. So this equation is very general. You can solve it for n levels, but we're just going to solve it for two. Apparently, this is the only uh, exactly solvable model. So on the um, diagonal, you just have the magnitude time in independent magnitude of the perturbation, and your off diagonal terms couple your excitations between level one and two, for example, or transition from two to one, for example. So where does this equation lead us? So for example, uh, let's um, um, look at just the more general case. This is non-interacting Hamiltonian or two-level system in terms of the time-dependent perturbation. Um, you can uh, just ab absorb the time dependence only in those, those transition, uh, in the transitions between the levels. And uh, you can uh, you can call the diagonal terms uh, you can set the diagonal terms equals to zero, and you obtain two coupled differential equations of which we solved in class, and we obtained an equation for the uh, ev time evolution of the populations or is uh, co expansion coefficients of the wave function, which include um, a term that we call the rabbi frequency. So this is a function that uh, depends on size sine squared. So this looks uh, exactly like what Jabet just showed. Uh, sine squared of the rabbi frequency is a function of time. Um, so in the rabbi frequency, you have the strength of the perturbation, which is gamma, and you have a resonance condition. So when the energy of the transition is close to um, uh, the, is close to the uh, certain energy, you get a peak at that energy, which looks like a sync function, which uh, Jabba just showed. I should have copied and pasted those same uh, graphs. Uh, so those are the fundamental results for a two-level system in terms of the rabbi frequency and, uh, and gamma, which is the strength of the perturbation. But uh, what our motivation for the course was to look at not only excitations as a function of time of the system, uh, when you have a continuous pulse, which is very long, which is not very realistic. In experiments, you usually have a short pulse, which excites the system, and then you uh, wait and you see what happens. For example, in NMR, you apply a magnetic field for a very short period of time. To a sample, you flip all the spins in one direction, and then you wait for all the spins to relax, and you look at the magnetic field throughout the whole time. So I don't know. So that, that was, I asked that question when this was introduced. I asked that question to Dmitry, and I don't know if that I don't know if that was his motivation for going into what's next. But we developed um, a method for describing what's called free induction decay, which is you look at the system, how it relaxes as a function of time. Uh, so the, the math, was the, the mathematics of it was very complicated, and you kind of have to go through it in order to understand it conceptually better, but you can also, but you can get a feel for it. So what is the block sphere? The block sphere is um, 
a very general mathematical construct. When you have a system, when you have a two-level system, uh, for example, um, the easiest way to explain it is uh, in terms of spins, in, uh, when you have, can have spin up and spin down. Uh, but uh, how can you tell which way your total spin projection points? Um, uh, this, you, you can just look at uh, the angles theta and phi, which define what's called the block sphere. So this is a solution to a very general Hamiltonian, uh, very general H naught. Uh, the solution is kind of lengthy, but this this is a very general result that comes out. So a, a way to for a way to look at so it. It is a superposition of uh, ground and excited state. It is with normalized coefficients. It is a super. That's yes. That's yes. It's superposition of ground and excited state where the ground state is kind of oriented along the z-axis. So if your total vector points along the z-axis exactly, then you're in the ground state. As uh, you move away from the z-axis, the more you move away from the z-axis, the more perpendicular you are to the z-axis, the more you are into the excited state. And you can just see that the z-axis only depends on theta. And that's how it's defined, right? Um, the z-axis is, uh, is only is special because it, for example, it's like the z-axis in the uh, complex plane. I've even heard, not, even, not here, but I, going over this, I saw it uh, com uh, compared, I think, in Sakurai, that the block sphere is like the complex plane in three dimensions. That's, that's it. Okay, so box here very very useful tool for illustrating spin projection. So okay, so let's let's move on. Another thing that we need to introduce is pulse area theorem. So you can excite your system with a pulse of a certain length in time, and only the area under the pulse in time is what matters for the number of transitions between your levels. So it's area in time. It's hard to think about it. So the pulse still has some x dependence because it's usually not a rectangular pulse. Although we started with a rectangular pulse in class, but then we saw that a Gaussian pulse is more realistic. So this is the, the x dependence just tells you the shape, the envelope of the pulse. And the uh, area is actually area in time. It's not area in space. So if you have, a, for example, a pi over 2 pulse, it's an important one because it uh, uh, drives the occupancies of the two levels to one half. Uh, pi pulse is also special to look at because it totally flips the occupation. Uh, numbers. Uh, the dotted lines in this figure are uh, the complex phases of the occupancies, which will be important later. The solid lines are the occupation. So the occupation of excited state, occupation of, sorry, blue is occupation of ground state, which is one at the beginning, green is occupation of excited state. So only the area under the pulse matters. So what we need to do is take an ensemble average of all the systems that are in our sample. So in an NMR sample, you have many hydrogen, many, not hydrogen, whatever atoms you have. So you need to look at the spin projection. You need to look at the uh, length, not the length. So, sorry, yes, the length and the projection of your spin vector, total spin vector, as a function of time. And if you want to do this with wave functions, it's hopeless because you have to look at each element of the ensemble. So another clever uh, quantum mechanical technique is what's called a density matrix. Why is it uh, 
easier to work with is because all you have to do once you figure out your density matrix is take the trace of the matrix with whatever observable you're trying to measure. Uh, how exactly are the elements of the uh, density matrix defined in uh, class we define them as the product of um, the uh, the absolute no yeah the what was the name of that product conjugate times anyways uh, the product of the two the conjugate product the complex the conjugate product yeah yeah up yeah of the two po of the two um, okay the, of the two expansion coefficients for each uh, level in our system so this is a familiar picture to everyone in the class so going from c1 c2 c3 we can go to uh to row 1 1 row 1 which is uh those um oh, yeah. I couldn't call transitional densities or made density matrix elements, density matrix elements, um, where uh, uh, two features to notice in the uh, in this matrix, which is called the Luvial super operator, um, the two terms in the middle. Uh, are only responsible for phase accumulation. And the terms that contain the rabbi frequency are due to the external perturbation, are due to the force that you're driving your system. So if there was no force in your system, everything would be zero except for these two terms, which uh, will just amount to uh, phase accumulation and will not affect any observables. Uh, so this density matrix approach makes it very easy, for example, to uh, express the expectation value of spin in a certain direction. So uh, in terms of the C1, C, CI daggers, CI, dagger cj comp product that we defined row one two in terms of those you can obtain uh, uh, differential equation for each one and uh, upon uh, so, so in class we went through each one of these uh, 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 time derivatives of this, each one of these expectation values, and we express them in just the expectation value of the spin in some other uh, direction. So for example, Sx depends on Sy, S, oh, there's a mistake. Sz depends on, oh, there's, this is a, uh, this is X, Y, and Z here. Uh, there is one term missing in the uh, in the middle row, but and the, for the expectation value of s sub z. But do not worry, just present concepts and. Okay, so okay, yeah, so the, ex, the time derivative of uh, s x x y and z can be expressed in just the expectation value of s x s y and z. Uh, so in this uh, formalism, the time dependence of the total vector, the length of the total spin vector is zero. Is zero. That means it's constant. That means on the block sphere, the tip of the total spin projection will always lie on the surface of the sphere. So there is no relaxation, which we need in order to uh, describe NMR. Because in NMR, as we know, the total magnetization, which is proportional to this uh, quantity, is eventually comes to zero. So what we need to do is we need to introduce uh, extra terms in each one of the equations. Uh, indices are uh, wrong again. Sorry about that. But for e for each equation, for each expectation value, 
uh, you just need to um, add, uh, or in this case, we subtract a term. At this point, these terms were phenomen phenomenological. Um, so the, uh, depending on what T1 and T2 is, will tell us how fast the total spin vector will, uh, will relax as a function of time. Uh, so the, uh, the T1, the one that multiplies the Z projection, we call it a trans transverse relaxation, and the other one longitudinal relaxation. Um, so when there is no ensemble, for when you take for certain uh, transition between some level one and two, for example, uh, you can uh, write it as uh, the magnitude of this uh, transition at time zero times the time dependence, uh, which is uh, absorbed in this uh, uh, exponential factor. Um, but with with an ensemble, you have to uh, sum over all members of the ensemble, and what that's what the letter J stands for, which with a little bit of math we turn into an integral over uh, epsilon one two where epsilon one two varies now because every a member of the ensemble has a different energy of excitation, slightly different. That was the big assumption. Um, we also, we didn't derive this, but it, um, uh, it makes sense to assume that. So uh, for transition one to two, for example, for, high, for proton, one for proton two, three, four ion or proton. Uh, so this defines this uh, D interval in, this is an interval in energy. Um, this is a famous picture but by Dr. Dmitry Killing. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, so uh, then uh, we ran some MATLAB code written again by Dr. Killing that shows the complex phase of our uh, um, expansion coefficients as a function of time for each member of the ensemble. And in, in this uh, particular code, we had 40 ensembles. The black line shows the complex phase uh, in the isolated single molecule. But when we added uh, many other uh, members of the ensemble where omega was randomly shifted, was, was on, on the, the interval was the same between each member. But yeah, but I, I guess you just ran, we just picked some, some number to, to shift each energy level between the 40 members of the ensemble. And it looks like the shift in the energy is the same because the change in, in the oscillation of the complex phase is the same. But anyway, so this shows black line, isolated molecule, many colorful lines, many molecules in our ensemble. So when we have the ensemble, the system eventually, uh, the pulse excites the system and uh, the pi over two pulse creates these uh, half occupation levels. So the observable is the same, but the complex phase is different. And the complex uh, phase comes in um, uh, right. So so when you wait. I Oh, yeah. May I interrupt you? Doesn't look like you are doing a review. You just given a lecture now. Yeah, you go into all technical details, and I completely miss the point where we are going uh, We're... to. What is your final destiny? This is our final destiny. <laughs> so when you plot the expectation value of the spin total spin projection as a function of time. When you have an ensemble of many systems, um, the this uh, different accumulation of phase matters 
in uh, the expectation value of total spin projection. So now we can look at an observable. Now we can look at this well, the different observable, which is total spin. So let's say you excite our system with a pi over two pulse and um, um, we make a uh, total spin vector with a certain magnitude, almost 0.25. But then as we wait, it shortens and it, om and it goes, almost goes back down to zero, but then it starts to oscillate because of this sync function property. And if you excite it at exactly the right time with another pi pulse, then almost nothing happens. And a certain amount of time later, which is proportional to the difference in the time between the two pulses, the spin projection decreases again. Uh, so this is what's referred to as this spin echo. It's because you pump the system, you wait, and then you see the magnetization vector come out. There is a similar there is a similar effect in photon echo when we're talking about then we'll be talking about um, uh, electric field uh, vector, but spin echo is very uh, easy in order to introduce the concept echo and free induction decay. This is also from MATLAB code that Dr. Killing wrote. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. The energy presentation is open for discussion. So I will no, leave. this time you were the first. No, ladies first. Oh, thank you. So, uh, you, <laughs> where can we see the rabbit? Is it possible to see rabbit oscillations in the real uh, world? In the in real? real examples in real systems you have to drive your system with uh, a pulse for a long time and somehow observe the change in the occupation numbers um, yes it can be done by very complicated well, right, experimental. It appears just if you uh, if you apply the sign uh, the sign field, right? The sign field, yes. Which but is electromagnetic field can be very easily uh, kind of uh, modified into the sign uh, mm -hmm. response, right? And then you're supposed to see the Rabi oscillations, right? Yes, you. Oh no! Uh, can they apply? Okay. Can they does apply it, a rectangular pulse for a long time in experiments? I don't see the problem, why not? I well, I would give you another hint, maybe. Um, how does rabbi oscillations deal with coherency? How do they deal with coherency? Oh, how, how is your density matrix deals with coherency? Do they, do they, do they have any <laughs> relationship between coherency what or decoherency? What do you mean by coherence? You didn't talk about coherency of a system when you're representing the Density matrix. What is the coherence on your figure that you are showing right now? Uh, coherence is at the peaks of these because many atoms are aligned. Okay, now I see what. Mm -hmm. Because many atoms all are aligned in the same direction, so mm -hmm. maybe that's what they refer to as coherence. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I just never heard it called like that. Huh? So can we see rabbi oscillations or not in the real systems? Well, you won't... You won't get to this without rabbi oscillation, without the, just the, without the mathematical construct. You won't, you won't obtain this envelope. But because the expectation value of spin projections depend on the Rabi oscillations. But Rabi oscillations are... Um... Well, suppose you have in the system where you have two levels, right? Yeah. Means your lowest level and the ground state levels are very spread, are very well separated from any other levels, right? Mm -hmm. So you can really think, oh, this is a two-level system. 
it's a, and then again uh, applying the electromagnetic field you expect that it would present the right distillation but it, Wait. Probably you already kind of, you didn't answer, but I think you are really and now hesitating saying that, yeah, it will, which means it probably will not. Well, you or maybe at only at some specific conditions, or maybe at some specific situation. Rabi oscill okay, so the Rabi oscillations, the Rabi frequency, you can observe it at the resonance condition when the energy is equal to the transition energy. That's where the peak. Uh, the Rabi frequency on the frequency spectrum is so if this condition is not but your Rabi oscillations will again telling you that you will have 50% population of the high state and 50% of the low and they will when you have a pi over 2 pulse yeah yeah oscillating uh Oh, when you have a pi over two pulse, you will. Is this what? It's just one quarter of full Rabi one. oscillation. Yes, full Rabi oscillations are the, the oscillations of C1 uh, and C2 absolute value squared, right? As a function of time. Oh. So the oscillations of the populations is a function of time. And how does this answer my question? Do you see or not do you see? Do you see or you don't uh, the rabbi oscillations in real cases, in the real situations, in the real systems? Can you give an example of a real system that shows rabbi exhibit, uh, multiple rabbi oscillations? This system was uh, presented by Javid in one of his presentations. Do you have the rest of presentations? No, it's it's in the beginning of each presentation, right? No, 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 no. So, a system that exhibits multiple rabbi oscillations. And, or, or what should be the condition for such system? Do not hesitate. There is uh, nothing challenging in this. For each system, you just increase the intensity of the pulse ten times, and then you have ten oscillations. In with increasing intensity, you increase the number of oscillations. Right, according to your pulse area theory. The pulse. According to the pulse area theorem, yes. Can you show it? Uh, yes, no, sure. With increasing the length of the pulse, you increase the number of oscillations, but not or the intensity. Can you think, uh, point by your finger to the equation? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So, uh, for which does it, what is in this uh, integral? Uh, transition type of moment. Times? Times the electric field. So, what happens if you increase your electric field? Oh, okay. Two times or ten times. Yeah. Uh, you increase the amplitude. But how does it reflect uh, on the number of radio solutions? Uh, you have to increase the length. Oh, okay. No, it's, it's the area. Yes, okay. That's right. Oh, that's right. So, yeah, even if it's taller, you'll have a bigger area. Yeah. Then it will increase the number of radio solutions. Um, but again, my lasers, understanding is okay. Um, in, in, in a laser, you will okay. the more you crank up the voltage, so the, the higher is the coherency, right? As soon as your system uh, preserves coherency, behaves coherently, right? You mm -hmm. will see, like, rabbit stations would be a sign of coherency of the system. Mm -hmm. However, you probably not expect that coherency will be holding forever. Right? No, no. Yes. There will appear decoherence due to any kind of uh, thermal, thermal fluctuations, right? Yeah. Any kind of random effects mm -hmm. will destroy this coherence, yes, right? That's right? And which means you will be kind of losing your rabbi oscillations with time and everything will go to the ground state. That's right. It will not really oscillate up and down without external field forever, right? Right. 
Right. So and, he, um, and so this is my understanding is that you probably talked about coherency, right? And of course, the uh, the transition density is uh, oh sorry the density matrix mm -hmm. also holds information about coherency of a, uh, coherency of a state, mm -hmm. right? So and uh, in ideal world, of course, you just can assume everything is coherent. And your uh, your uh, example with lasers, right, where we have really the most coherency as possible, probably will be represented in the laser field. Yep. It's, as it's long as really you have some driving process, voltage, right? yeah. So that's why, kind of, you can have some coherent situation in a maybe short period of time, and you can see your rabbi oscillations for a very short period of time, and then you can just think how you can increase this time, like increase the field probably will help, or so on. But in reality, you always have decoherence occurring, right? And this decoherence results in a losing your rabbi oscillations. Am I right? Yeah. 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 Right, right. Good. <laughs> if I was uh, in the line to ask a question. Um, so on your last slide, you don't need to go there if you don't want. Uh, you say that... Oh, you, this is really hard. <laughs> yeah. Not to go. <laughs> you say that you have to choose a specific time for the echo to occur. Uh, yeah. Is that true or can you choose any time and I don't two think... times that interval where you see an echo? It's... I'm not sure if it's two times that interval. Um, I think you this sec for the second pulse you have to apply it when the block vector goes back down to zero. In order, because the echo ta the time for the second pulse depends on when you apply this pulse. Yeah, it's two so times the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no. Okay, so this time, this the echo time depends on the on when yes, you apply the pulse. So you said that you have to do the pi pulse at a specific time. Mm -hmm. Is that true or not? You can apply it. Depends on time. when you want to see your echo, then. Yes, you okay. have to calculate. Any, any you have time, to do the calculations. Anytime you do the pi pulse, you get an echo two times the duration between the pulses. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Good. That, no, that's <laughs> not, no, 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 that's not exactly right. If you wait for this to go all the way down, no, zero. No, no, and then, and then you apply a pi pulse, you, you immediately you, flip them. Then no, echo will be... You have, like, you have to get your dephasing correct. So you dephase, and if you do a pi pulse, then you say, hey, rewind the tape. And then you get your... Is that right? I, have, I, have, I don't know. Like if you, I think so you if, if you wait for this to go all the way to zero, you wait for a long you time, back to and then you apply the pi pulse, then you have to wait a long time. Correct. Yes. Can you go back to your ensemble picture? I thought it was the inverse relation. So here, right? What what is the dashed black lines? The it's just the complex phase of is C1 that, and C2. Is that average? Um, no, can this you is for isolated molecule. The dotted black lines. Yes. Yeah. The dotted black the is for C1 and C2. Solid dash. Solid. Solid, the, the thick, solid thick, dash. Thick dash. Thick dash. Yes. Black. Thick yes. dash. Yes. 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 Which equation of these two corresponds to this? The upper one. Um, try to think again. <laughs> oh, is this the average of all the. Yes. All the yes. Oh. <laughs> Correct answer. Can you finger where it is? Where is this average? It's, okay. Which of these two equations? So the upper equation, the upper equation is 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 here. Yes. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. that's why you can do it at any time because you dephase and then it averages to zero. Then if you reverse your phase, then you're good. Right? Levi was paying better attention. <laughs> Very good question. Now we, we you see benefit of discussion session right that's right yeah. more questions to jen to make his uh, talk a record for <laughs> okay let's thank jen once again <laughs> and the last but not least presentation is by aaron fordy whom i want to come up and um i do not have steam to give long introduction but in some sense, he will teach us how to violate energy conservation law. Okay. That's a pretty big prelude you give. Um, where am I on your diagonal? See, see this diagonal? Oh, there's the diagonal. Yeah. Okay. 
Yes. There we go. <laughs> okay, so I'll be speaking about the fifth chapter that we covered in the class, which we covered motivation for uh, of how relaxation happens due to a noisy bath. Uh, conditions for thermal equilibrium with, I didn't explicitly talk quantum versus classical bath, I focus more on quantum, so I look forward to some hard questions on that. Um, some microscopic theory behind the quantum heat bath. Uh, the, the tools that we use to describe the time evolution of the system. So commutation relations and how population relaxation actually works. So my intro slide, dynamics. So we have a two-level quantum system coupled to an ensemble of quantum harmonic oscillators. So on the top of the screen, we have N harmonic oscillators, which are I tried to approximate as parabolas. They all have energy populations that can be occupied. And then we couple this ensemble to a two-level state where state A is the ground, we define as a ground state, and B as the excited state. And then gamma represents the transition between those states, and then N represents the phonon modes, which we'll see how those come, or the average of quanta from the phonon modes, which we'll see at the end of the presentation. So who needs this tool for modeling? So basically, whenever you're trying to model the dynamics of some system that's in a big noisy bath, so, or the bath where it's, it's basically inherently random, and then every, you can model everything as fluctuations that happen within the bath. So things that you would, or systems that you'd want to track the evolution of would be like electron spin states, how the noisy bath would influence the orientation of spins, or for photo excitations, how the noisy bath affects the transitions between, uh, after your photo excitation, photo excitation, how it evolves. And then you could also do like ions and solvents, so where you have a lot of water molecules constantly hitting your ion. So, and that could be pictorially described as we have our system that's surrounded by a big bath, and then we have some sort of something that pokes the system and perturbs it, that creates it, takes out of equilibrium. And then to get back into equilibrium, we have arrows representing the energy flow outside of the bath. And then I specifically, I specific, specifically noted that uh, there's no, even though it is an open system, there's nothing from the bath going into the system because we assume that the bath is always in equilibrium, so there's no need for energy to go into the system from the bath. So the main mathematical tool that we use to describe the time evolution of the density matrix is the reduced density operator. So for the top equation, it represents the density matrix that uh, Deanne described earlier. And then this part specifically is the second order perturbative expansion of the density matrix where the zeroth order, like it, it depends on initial conditions, so we just set that to zero. And then the or zeroth order depends on initial conditions, so we just set that to zero. The first order depends, it basically averages out at the end of the calculation, so we just ignore that. So the most significant term that we focus on is, is the second, so that's why we leave that. It has a double commuter between two different inter interactions, and then the, the, com commutator. What did I say? Commutator. Commutator. Yes. That depends on two different potentials at different time intervals and then our density. So we start with describing the time evolution of the system and the bath, but we only really care about the system, and we only care about how the bath acts onto the system. So to describe just the system part, we take the trace, which is basically just turning all the elements from the bath into numbers, and then we use a trace operation, so we describe only the time evolution of the bath. So basically the trace operation just goes on the inside of the integral. So basically the only two things that we have to figure out for this equation is the form that we want our potentials to be, and then the form of our density matrix. There should be a bath on there too, to trace over the system and the bath. So for our system and the bath, we say, we assume there's, there's no correlation at any time between the system and the bath, so we just say that they're products of each other. And then we know that we are doing, we're coupling harmonic oscillators, so we use, for a bath, we uh, make it products of all the harmonic modes, that, or the density of all the harmonic modes, which is basically the dyadic product of each of the harmonic states times the probability of occupations for each state as you go up 
the lighter of the harmonic oscillator, which is represented by n. And then for our interactions, we assume that there's no correlation between the system and the bath operators, but that they act independently, so they're products. And then for the system, this is, represents the, like the mixing of two different states due to the motion of ions. And then for the bath, we just use the momentum operator, which uh, in the language of um, uh, ladder operators is represented as the, the minus of the lowering operator of the plus operator. And then those are explicitly noted here. And then we have two different modes that we're summing over, so k because of the commuter for the double commutations. So we do go over k and k prime. So that's those notations stand for. So basically we've set up the problem, and if you want to go through the nitty-gritty details, there's an hour and 40 minutes video on YouTube that goes through all the mathematical steps. But basically what we get from doing all these steps is we get uh, transition rates due to the coupling of the states and the autocorrelations of the baths. We also get due to, well, I guess we'll go to the next slide. So those give us our rates. And then the ends represent the average number of quanta from the harmonic oscillators. So and then we get the n's and n plus ones, and those come from the commutation relations. And yeah, then we also get expectation values from the reduced density matrix where they're convoluted with the ground state and the excited state. And then if we assume a steady state solution, so our, that our time derivatives are zero, so that there's no change in the occupations of the state, we basically, if this is zero, we can solve the equations and we get ratios of the, of the excited state over the populated state. So that turns out to be n over n plus one, which turns out to be a Boltzmann factor. So that essentially tells us that the transition from A to B is a Boltzmann factor less likely than from B to A or it's more likely to go from excited to ground state than from ground state to excited state. So then these are just some illustrations from the labs that we did. So if we assume that there's zero temperature so that none of the harmonic modes are oscillated, or that none of the harmonic oscillators are filled at all, so basically it's just there's no thermal motion to couple with the electronic states. So if we assume initial conditions where everything's in the ground state, we're going to get uh, zero because we put zero in the denominator over the exponential. That's gonna make it e to the negative infinity, which basically gets zero. So we're always gonna be in our, so our steady state will always be in the, or our equilibrium state will be fully populated in the ground state and none in the excited state. And then after, if we do a pi pulse, even after the transition, it will eventually go back into the ground state. And then if we have a finite temperature, and then our initial condition is fully populated in the ground state, it will eventually equilibrium to a steady state, which defines equilibrium for this case. And if we just put a finite number in for our KT, we'll get some sort of number in between zero and one. So our equilibrium state will be some proportion of like 80% in the ground state and 20% in the excited state. And then if we put an infinite, temp infinite energy into the system, basically, well, if we put infinity into our Boltzmann factor, we'll get a ratio of one. So that assumes that the ground state and the excited state will be equal, or they'll have equal populations. And even if we try to drive it out of the excited state, it's, we have an infinite, there's an infinite energy keeping it into this uh, steady state solution. So it's not gonna move. Okay, let's thank uh, Adam. And his presentation is open for questions. Can you go a couple of slides quick just to give us something to criticize? Oh, to go all down. Uh, like one more. Uh, I don't have a question yet. I just want to look at the slides. Okay, while you are looking, I would like to ask. Uh, of questions. So you introduced this gamma capital. Mm -hmm. How does it relate to Jabot and Fermi's golden rule? They are 
very closely correlated. So they basically have the same form, where it's coupling squared between the states times the, well, I guess if we're in a continuous state, it would be the times the density of states. Good. So they're basically equivalent. Uh -huh. Can you formulate it by words what is detailed balance principle? Uh, it's basically it's, what you presented in the last three slides, but uh, right. can you re-verbalize it? I don't know. Like, I've had questions about this myself. Like I can't, I've never found like a good explanation that makes sense to me, but it's basically that your rates of transition between both of the states just kind of equal out so that, yeah, I don't really have a coherent answer. Go good, ahead. good, good. So uh, repeat, what equals out? So the rates between the ground state to excited state and excited state to ground state. So mm -hmm. basically, okay, like the yeah. reverse rates are equal mm -hmm. from going to excited to ground up, excited, excited to down. So you are telling that there is a special relation between rates of transitions with increase of system energy and decrease of system energy. Mm -hmm. There is a balance between them by given equation. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. You have the zero dot number. Yeah, it's, it's crude notation. Like I just tried to show it's a decimal, so it's a. It's going to be between zero and one. Oh, zero point. Yeah, yeah it's zero point and us. Okay. Yeah, it was late at night. Right. So I understand. No, it is. trust me. Um, more questions? I have I have a question to Aaron and to the whole class. In which aspect Einstein was wrong? Related to our class. Oh, okay. No, no, well, we all are wrong in many, many things. Does that have to dice? Hmm? It relates to uh, spontaneous emission. So how many Einstein coefficients do we remember? A and B. So B. Oh, two. How many B coefficients? So A is for spontaneous and mm -hmm. B is for... Stimulated. Okay, stimulated. So how many stimulated coefficients are there? One for yeah. emission and another for stimulated absorption. absorption. Two, right? Mm -hmm. Stimulated emission and stimulated absorption. How many spontaneous coefficients are? Which is, oh yeah, there's spontaneous. Going downward, there's no spontaneous going Spon upward. Spontaneous emission. Energy. Uh, according to your equations. Yes. Which one corresponds to spontaneous emission? Which term corresponds to spontaneous emission? So be the change in the excited state. So the the lower equation. Then it would be this term, right? Okay. Yes. So if at zero temperature you get this n uh, disappearing equals zero, and you have only this uh, occupation of excited state getting decreased. Mm -hmm. But at finite temperature, do we have only spontaneous emission, or we have on also spontaneous? I think it's absorption. Yes. We do, we, do we have spontaneous absorption in this equation? Um, yeah, I guess that would be this term, wouldn't it? The, the R. Yep. The yeah, absorption gain of P, so it'd be this yep. one. Okay. So you do have spontaneous absorption. Mm -hmm. Does Einstein have spontaneous absorption? I guess he didn't think that far ahead. Okay, so there is an aspect in which you are ahead of Einstein. <laughs> well, in the, the whole class. Um, more questions to Eric? More questions one, more questions two, more questions three. No, oh, okay. No, 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 I was okay. ready. <laughs> Let's thank Aaron. And uh, with this, I would like to announce the successful completion of the um, Quantum 2 course, Chem 7.
six, seven. Um, you will soon see the grades uh, through online, and you will be positively surprised because you invested 200 time, 200 percent effort compared to what was in, in the books. And uh, I hope very much that um, you will be able to apply your new skills and uh, a little of uh, additional knowledge baggage in order to argue with uh, reviewers. Thank you much. Meeting and the course is dismissed. See you next year on next courses or during the research.